Okay, it looks like it's time to get started. Um, just want to welcome everybody here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, today, we uh, this is our Behavioral Health Webinar Series. Uh, my name is Kate Tramps, and today we have our Program Director, Anna Helena Skinstad, presenting uh, Native Women with Substance Use Disorders Are Different. And um, I just wanted to mention, too, that Dara Jefferson, um, who is a consultant with us now and is a previous and uh, future staff member again, um, she's from the Meskwaki tribe here in Iowa. Uh, she also contributed to this webinar but couldn't be with us today. So I just wanted to um, make note of that as well. This training series is brought to you by the National American Indian and Alaska Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center. We are part of the ATTC network, which also includes 10 regional centers, five international centers, a network coordinating office, and the National Hispanic and Latino ATTC. In the next couple of days, we will send out a follow-up email to everyone who attended, which includes a link to the recording, handouts of the slides, and a CEU request form. Our center is an ADAC certified educational provider, and we'd be happy to, prov to provide you with CEUs for a $15 fee. Immediately following today's webinar, you will be redirected to our GIPRA evaluation. This survey takes just a few minutes to complete and asks about your satisfaction with the event. This feedback is critical to our future work, and we value your opinion and would greatly appreciate your time in sharing your thoughts with us. You will be muted for the duration of this webinar, so please use the chat pod to share your comments and questions, and we will address questions at appropriate points during the presentation. Today's speaker is Dr. Angelina Skinstad. Dr. Skinstad is the program director for the National American Indian and Alaska Native ATTC, MHTTC, and PTTC. She is a clinical professor in the Department of Community and Behavioral Health in the College of Public Health at the University of Iowa. Prior to her work in the US, Dr. Skinstad was the chief psychologist for the first inpatient treatment unit for women with, this, with substance use disorders and their children in Bergen which is the first of its kind in Norway. Her research and clinical interests continue to be on assessment and treatment of women with substance use disorders and the treatment and assessment of clients with coexisting mental health and substance use disorders. So at this time, I would like to pass things over to Dr. Skinstad, and she will take it from here. Just pulling up her slides a moment, and then, uh... okay, there we go. Um, Dr. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, as you indicated in your introduction, this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart and have been for more years than I can count. So I look forward to spending time with you today and to include you in some of the things that I think impor is important to know when we address Native women. Um, this is part of the overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, we are going to cover a little bit the long history of the National American Indian and Alaska Native TTCCs, and that also, when we go into the topic, we cannot not talk about historical and generational trauma and what, how that really gets expressed in substance abuse, substance abuse in women with poly substance abuse, substance abuse in Native women we call occurring disorders, and looking at treatment options and barrier to treatment. Uh, but of course, what we need to do is to say that the National American Indian and Alaska Native TTCs are funded by our SAMHSA CSET uh, federal funding agency and that means that the content of this publication and presentation does not necessarily reflect the views or the policy of SAMHSA or HHS. I think it's always important to acknowledge our elder. And the elder for our center is Dr. Dwayne Mackey, who passed away way too early for us, but gave us a great 
legacy to build on, and we continue to do that as we speak. He was the American Indian Alaska Native uh, coordinator of the initiatives that we developed together from 1998 until he passed away prematurely. He was a leader in the Native community in the Upper Midwest, was a Santee Sioux tribal member, and she um, and he did uh, develop the Native American cultural sensitivity curriculum that received an award from the Annapolis Coalition on Behavioral Health uh, as the most innovative initiative in workforce development. So we are very indebted to our friend, uh, Dr. Mackey. This is something that I think Kate already indicated. This is what the map of the ATTC network looks like. And here are staff members and staff members working on the tribal opiate response initiatives and staff members working on leadership development, which is a program we are going to start initiating in August of this year. Again, we also are the recipients of the National American Indian and Alaska Native M a Mental Health TTC, exactly the same map, but with different players and with different staff. You can recognize some of us, but the staff members um, that are specifically focused on the mental health aspect of our center is Megan Dotson and Natasha Peterson. We also have the prevention TTC. Again, same map, but different players. And uh, the manager or coordinator of that is Cindy Sago. Um, and similar players again. What I'd like to say something about before we start is that we have taken a very specific approach to working with American Indian tribal and urban Indian communities. And the reason why we've done that is because it's important to listen, it's important to collaborate, and it's important to have um, partners all over the country. So we have advisory council members that are from all over the country, tribal, urban, and um, almost 100%, I think 99% of our advisory council are all from Native communities. We are very, very focused on, when I'm saying listening, we are in the middle of a year of listening, and we take community-based participatory programming and research really very seriously. We want to have a bi-directional dialogue with our tribal communities. We want to make sure we participate in community activities because, as we all know, there are very many tribal communities across the country with different cultures. And we are also very aware of how often people have come into a tribal communities, a tribal community, uh, delivered their service, and then left. Um, what we are very focused on is to understand and really take seriously what is in there for the tribal community. If we can't provide feedback to the community and properly understand their need and take a strength-based approach to understanding their need, then we will not have a good working relationship. We also need to understand the history of this Native community and again, focusing on community strength and not deficits. 
acknowledging that there are very many federally recognized tribes. I think 567 is a lower number. I think we are up now to over 570 tribes and many state recognized tribes and county recognized tribes. It all depends on what part of the country you live. And what is important for us to all remember is that of all the American Indian Alaska Natives across the country, 70% of them live in urban Indian areas, but they receive disproportionately less funding for treatment than tribal programs. Uh, we will know that Indian Health Service is very actively involved in providing treatment and prevention services, but there are also what we refer to as 638 programs that are focused on the tribal sovereignty and self-determination and use their dollars maybe in a little different way than other tribal programs, but very focused on what is specific for this tribal, pro tribal community. When we think in uh, treatment and services, we always think about the fact that there are very many ways people express their Native American uh, connection. Some live a very traditional life on Native land. Others in the tribal community outside of Native land, especially urban Indian, may feel very assimilated. And some may be bicultural, feeling with a foot in each um, both traditional and assimilated world, and may commute between living in an urban area and going home to their home nation and participating in the activities that the community offers. What one of the things that Dr. Mackey taught us was when he developed the Native American Cultural Sensitivity Program, it was very important for him to make us look forward but never forget the past. And translated a little bit is how can we build on strength and never forget what we struggle with and what we have experienced in the past. So historical trauma is very, very important for us to understand and really respect because there are a lot of traumatic experiences that a person experiences over a lifespan, but also across generation. And knowing what kind of group trauma somebody discovered or experienced in the past is affecting people in the present. And remembering that colonization had a very traumatic impact on Native communities. Forced resettlements, and I just want to remind you about the Trail of Tears, where there are, we always think about the Trail of Tears going from east to west. There were trails of tears in whatever direction, up along the west coast, um, etc. It wasn't just one way. What is also very important is the children were forcibly separated from their families and sent to boarding schools. And that started in 1891. And it wasn't until the Indian Child Welfare Act in 1978 that uh, this was not something uh, that was forced upon them. That doesn't mean kids don't still live in uh, boarding schools, but there is much more focus on how can you uh, 
um, if there is adoption, if there is other issues in a family, how can you support this child in staying within the culture? And I also want to re uh, remind everybody that settlers came to this country in the 1600s and for going forward for religious freedom. The native communities didn't get their religious freedom until 1978, meaning that a lot of um, ceremonies and cultural activities were hidden because they couldn't express their religious connectedness. And we should never underestimate the lasting impact of loss of homeland, culture, and way of life. So with that backdrop, I think we need to um, look at this and think about what it would mean when, that we would be forced to send our kids uh, to someone we didn't know and where the people couldn't speak their language, could not um, keep their hair long. There are many, many things um, that were inflicted on the kids through the years. If we looked at subs in substance use disorders in Native women, um, there are very clear data that the prevalence of drug use for both genders was higher and highest among American Indian and Alaska Native. Parallel to this pattern is drug abuse among American Indian and Alaska Native. What we don't remember is that there are a much higher percent of both men and women in the Native communities who do not use alcohol, who do not use uh, drugs at all. And if you look at that, for men, that percentage is 32.7%, and for women, almost 47%. We also see that there is a high prevalence of alcohol use and also a higher prevalence of drug use and poly substance abuse. But the, what we need to remember is we see when people are intoxicated, we do not see all the people who are not using alcohol at all. Um, if you look at this, um, there are differences between substance use in different regions, in different tribal communities. So, Northern Plains, um, six times more, Southern, Southwestern Indians, uh, 1.7 times more likely than the U.S., a reference group to engage in binge drinking. And if you look here at heaviest drinking category, Southwest women um, were higher than the general population, but much lower than the Northern Plains women. And if you look here, the percentage of women using illicit drugs are comparable to rates for men except in younger age group, in which percentage rates of illicit drug use by women in some tribes are comparable to men. If we think in co-occurring disorders, uh, clients presenting with a mental health disorder also in 29% of the cases would be using alcohol or drugs. And again, if you turn it the other way around, 37% had a co-occurring mental health disorder if you were presenting with an alcohol drug issue. If you look at the American Indian women population, 
a substance abuse treatment reports higher rates of physical abuse, sexual abuse than male counterparts in the Native American community. If we looked at substance abuse in Native women, more than two thirds of the participants will have a lifetime and past year substance abuse disorder and will experience at least one co-occurring anxiety disorder. And anxiety can be caused by drinking, and it's often caused uh, as a result of child abuse or other traumatic risk factors. And anxiety disorders also contribute to relapse in substance abuse. What do we know about the antecedents to substance abuse in Native women? Uh, one of the major uh, antecedents is what we now refer to as adverse childhood experiences, often resulting in health disparities, both physically and mentally. And what is important is that there is a higher prevalence of adverse childhood experience uh, than in many other ethnic groups, including physical abuse, mental abuse, sexual abuse. Also antecedents to this is poverty, parental substance abuse, and parental mental health disorders. And abuse doesn't end in childhood. Um, antecedents may also be violence in adulthood, continued sexual physical abuse, domestic violence. And some tribes are patriarchal, some are matriarchal, and sometimes patriarchal family structures might predispose Native women to substance abuse and may disadvantage them. What we also know is that an antecedent can be previous difficult pregnancies. And what we also know is that being pregnant can predispose her for domestic violence. One of the things that really impact uh, substance use disorder is also chronic poverty. And the very frequent race-based stresses. And that means if you go, for instance, on to a school outside of a um, tribal community and you get ex bullying experiences, being teased, um, those are very, very uh, detrimental experiences for many um, Native women. And then you have the uh, gender-based violence. I want to specifically mention Native American LGBT two-spirit women that may experience gender-based violence more than non-Natives. What we do know also is that because of all these antecedents and experiences um, substance abusing women or Native women may have a higher prevalence of um, depression. I am not sure what's happening with my... Um, I. There we go. Thank you. Something happened to my slides. Um, low self-esteem, feelings that you're not able to accomplish what you really want to accomplish. And one of the things that really worries me is the very high suicide rate, which is a hidden epidemic, and we've seen it affecting adolescent girls in a very high prevalence in recent years. And that's something we really need to be cautious about as um, treatment providers and 
prevention providers. The lack of educational opportunities may also be a challenge. Um, they may be growing up in a tribal community where there is no access to a tribal college, where they where going out um, of tribal land for education may be very stressful. Um, one thing that I also want us to remember is that American Indian and Alaska Native women have greater odds of seeking treatment for anxiety disorders. What about Native pregnant women? Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is of great concern in tribal communities. And we want to make sure that people are aware that neonatal abstinence syndrome increased drastically between 2009 and 2014. And American Indian and Alaska Native women show disproportionate rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome and maternal opiate abuse. And what we also know is that neonatal abstinence syndrome from stimulant abuse is also on the rise, very parallel to the increase in stimulant abuse in Native communities. There are several programs that have been developed, and uh, I can't go into all of them, but I want you all to be aware that these programs have been uh, culturally adapted um, and chartering intersectional relationships in the context of life and substances. Circles is one program and empowering Native women with substance use disorder is also another one. Ogallala Sioux Tribe developed the CHOICE program, and that program is culturally and linguistically adapted, and the results show significant reduction of substance use disorders and risky sexual activity from three to six months following um, at follow-up visits. And we have also seen culturally informed and modified web-based expert in Southern California tribes. And that includes a peer-to-peer -peer based intervention, motivational interviewing, and uh, the study informed about how to modify and also culturally adapt evidence-based practices. What we also need to be very aware of is that assessment needs to be culturally um, adapted. And it's very important to do assessment by primary care providers as often as possible. Um, it's also important not to forget um, that Women who are incarcerated also need to be screened. Um, however, few assessment instruments are culturally informed and really validated. So it's important to, before you choose to uh, focus your intake procedure on a certain assessment instrument, to really look at how well is this assessment instrument culturally adapted. It's also very important given the fact that substance use in women also often co-occur with uh, mental health disorders, it's also important to routinely uh, do mental health assessment and assessment for abuse and domestic violence. So what about treatment? We hear a lot about evidence-based treatment, best practices, but it's not always as clear to us that 
um, experience-based practices and culturally informed and knowledge-based practices have been developed over many, many, many years, not necessarily through the Western model of randomized clinical trials, but still is a solid um, approach to treatment that oftentimes in combination with or adapted to evidence-based practices really have shown better results. In other words, we are looking at enhanced treatment options. And what I think is very important is to think about how tribal communities look at uh, treatment from a holistic perspective, much more so than we might find outside of tribal communities. What we do know is that residential treatment may be most effective. That means people are taken out of their challenging communities or family environment and given time to focus on themselves. And we have um, traditional based treatments, drum cycles as a gendered intervention. What we need to know is that we can't do treatment with women in native, from native communities without including family and understanding the extended family. It took me a long time to understand the family concept in different native communities and that is is very clearly um, different from the community outside of native communities but absolutely as crucial. We also need to know the historical trauma uh, what specifically constitutes the violence that they experience and be aware of the prevalence of physical violence, suicide, etc. And because there are so many needs, we need to look at a nuanced treatment approach, a holistic treatment approach, and look at the treatment approach towards trauma from a very much comprehensive perspective and at the same time not forgetting the community and their connection to their elders, their connection to their community in general. Um, oftentimes I have been told that cognitive behavioral therapy isn't working for native communities. We have now seen that culturally adaptive cognitive processing therapy has been very effective for PTSD, substance use disorder, and HIV sexual risk behavior. Reduces symptoms of PTSD and substance use disorder as well as high risk behavior. Motivational interviewing. Um, as most of you might know, developed by Bill Miller in Albuquerque. He was very close to the Native community, very inspired by the Native community, and that approach is very much um, more in um, line with the Native way of life. Um, Given that, still motivational interviewing has been culturally adapted or for Northwestern tribes by Tom Lin and her colleagues, um, for culturally adapted to Southwestern tribes by Venner and her colleagues. And what I also want to say is that our ATTC has created a specific training program um, called the Spirit of Communication and um, Dr. Tomlin and her colleagues are working with us on updating it to the third edition of Motivational Interviewing and we would be then ready to uh, offer that kind of training very soon I think. 
I've already discussed the importance of community and culture in the treatment process. And again, oftentimes when we talk about issues in Native communities, we have a tendency to see uh, the negatives, the challenges, but what is going to be important in the treatment of her is to understand the strength of the Native community. And understanding the importance of engagement in spiritual and ceremonial practices in Native communities. And also support the engagement of our clients in uh, AA and NA, meaning we need to help them find a culturally informed AA and NA. And it's very important to encourage engagement with other peers because that represents an alternative to a drinking community. Also, if we are looking at prevention and treatment of pregnant Native women, I really want to direct your attention to uh, the Tribal Maternal Infant an early childhood home visits program. And this is a program that has shown great promise, very good outcome results, and some other tribal communities may have used a visiting nurse approach so that there is a prenatal care component and a postnatal care component, and it's the visiting nurse that comes home. This specific program is built on empowering peers who have been pregnant, have had their child, maybe a teen, and the support they generate between each other. So I really recommend you look into this specific program. What we also need to think about is barriers to treatment. Uh, what we have often seen, and this is specifically in uh, situations with combination of depression, substance abuse, suicidality, that if we have to refer the client outside of the tribal communities, they are feeling really confronted with barriers to treatment. Um, Barriers because the people surrounding them don't understand what they are experiencing. Lack of connection to spiritual and re religious resources. And that's very important to be very sensitive to. Because if you don't understand, uh, overlook, you may lose the client's trust. And not be able to dialogue, dialogue sorry, properly. We also need to be respectful for social and cultural factors. If Remember the, the figure I showed in the beginning, some women may be more acculturated, assimilated, may not be as traditional, but still we need to know how does she want to be connected to the tribal community and in what form. Again, remember diagnostic tools may be culturally inappropriate. Um, also remember that perception, indigenous understanding and language of illness may be very different from um, the Western way of looking at an illness. And there is a long standing system of inequality. Um, and this idea that we often focus our first meeting with our clients on crisis orientation oriented outpatient services. 
not integrating traditional healers in the formal system of care and lack of a holistic wraparound coverage for culturally appropriate mental health services. All these things have a very important, uh, may have either a positive or negative impact on the treatment outcome. The other thing that we always, always need to remember is that there is relatively limited research on long-term mental health outcomes of American Indian and Alaska Native populations. When it comes to barriers to treatment of co-occurring disorders, one of the things that really is very clear is that uh, integrated treatment of mental health and substance abuse is the gold standard. But oftentimes in tribal communities, these mental health and substance abuse services may not be coordinated. There may be different level of support, health benefits for treatment of mental health disorders compared to substance use disorders. And this absence of a single focus responsibility for treatment of individuals with co-occurring disorder is quite um, apparent. We are worried and focused in our center on trying to increase the amount of cross-training among staff so people with substance abuse background or mental health background can know what each others are doing and how to collaborate. And there are different treatment philosophies between mental health and substance use treatment. And then, of course, there is lack of funding. I'd like to also have us think about the barriers to sustaining treatment and recovery. What we need, if we think in tribal communities, there is a very high unemployment rate, po poverty, and very invisible homelessness because it's much more couch surfing than living literally on the street. We have talked about fewer educational opportunities and lack of connectedness to the culture, risk of assimilation. Losing the cultural connection is actually quite challenging when it comes to um, sustaining recovery. And this uh, lack of grounded recovery support services that's culturally adapted is also something we need to think about. Sometimes the barrier can be the fire water myth, which is that um, Native Americans are more sensitive to alcohol. This is a myth and should not be thought about as a reason why it's very difficult to sustain recovery. Um, it's also important to enhance the intergenerational interaction and connection. And that, again, is to try to enhance recovery, but it can be a barrier if she is very isolated, doesn't have a connection to elders and her community. We've talked a lot about the role of family and family-based interventions. And this is, again, um, the program that I mentioned before. But there are three more programs with favorable effects on maternal substance use disorder, Family Spirit, Healthy Families America, and Nurse Family Partnership. And it's also important to look at culturally adapted community reinforcement approach, which is something that Dr. Venner in Albuquerque has worked on. And 
really focusing on engagement in cultural activities and relationship, extended families, clans, connecting to uh, the community at large. And the strengthening family programs has also been culturally adapted and showed good results. So these, um, thinking about the different models that have been developed for families um, with native members is really very important when you plan the development of a treatment program. And again, classic Western way is to diagnose the program problem, very often focusing on the negatives, and then build on that. How can we work on finding ways to reduce the negative impact on substances mental health? Of course, that's important. But even more important is to identify the strength in Native women in their community, focusing on her inner strength and focusing on her ability to help, uh, to heal, to love her family and her resilience and help her redevelop connection to family, children and community elders. It's important to help her find spiritual strength and, again, I discovered I was accepted in Native communities when people started making fun of you and me. Again, finding her humor is very important to help her, too. So, with that, I want to open it up for questions. I see someone is typing a question. Um, So I will wait for the question and try to answer them. I'm wondering if we can take <clears throat> let me see if I can take one <clears throat> I see that Dawn is asking me about why I think American Indian people women might have different long-term outcomes for mental health diagnosis um, I'm not sure I think that. Um, I think if we don't take into consideration all the specific cultural connectedness and family connectedness that she needs to have, that may mean that she may have a more hard time to stay uh, <clears throat> in recovery or have a harder time uh, getting her mental health back. On the other hand, when it comes to mental health, there may be issues of access to adequate uh, treatment, access to medications, access to mental health services. And here, Sarah is asking, is anyone aware of a home visiting model geared to pregnant women and families with new babies? Uh, I don't know. You're asking if the 
<clears throat> home visitors cross train in infant and early childhood substance use disorder outpatient treatment. Uh, what if you go to some of the visiting nurse programs? Uh, one of the very important things that those programs um, discovered was that the visiting nurse and also the peer support program were able to share experiences and the visiting nurse would be able to ask about how the baby was doing but also at the same time understand how she was doing and would be able to follow her and her child over a very long time and if you go to some of the NIDA funded project visiting nurse programs these effects were very strong and over extended period of time up to 15 years and what it meant was that because she had someone outside her family she could talk to about uh, child issues she got a lot of support in how to um, take care of her baby and at the same time got her education and after 15 years uh, compared to non women who had not had visiting nurse programs um, the kids and mom at age 15 uh, was much better off in school and mom had gotten her education completed so um, I think also if you look at the peer support programs the peers will be able to share similar experiences and be supportive on very many different levels I'm not sure if this is answer to your project um, your question but I have seen very very good results of this Um, somebody asks about reluctance from other family members when you try to form a bond with clients I think that's quite common I have a lot of experience with uh, doing treatment with women and now I'm not talking native women but treatment with women um, with substance use and mental health disorders where the family members didn't want to participate and one of the things that I felt was very important for me as a clinician was to support her in staying and maintaining her um, sobriety because family members when they saw that there was a change in behavior um, really changed and suddenly reached out I had no very I didn't have a good um, effect of demanding that the family members come in to the treatment when she was in treatment uh, but more helping her show that she had changed behavior I uh, Deanne um, asks about their specific consideration with women with substance abuse in connection with ICWA I, I'm not sure what you refer to there but um, if you can write that would be very great and I'll answer it then um, Craig is asking how does CPT differ from CBT and DBT um, <clears throat> I think the CPT is a culturally adapted version of, of cognitive behavioral therapy however dialectic behavior therapy um, is a specific program that was originally developed for uh, treatment of borderline personality disorder but is very um, good to use with people who have different difficulty expressing ex 
expressing um, emotions, uh, controlling, regulating emotions, and that program is very effective too. Um, <clears throat> what I can say is when it comes to other specific training programs like MI, um, our centers are working on finding different ways of training on cognitive behavioral treatment. What is important is oftentimes that may be different when we work with people with anxiety disorder, depression, etc. Uh, now I see what you mean, Deanne. Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, and what I really want to say uh, about that is that women, children are very, very important for women. And I think it's very important to think about how you help her engage with her children. And uh, sometimes that may mean that she would want to have her children back. And that's also fine. People can have get their children back. Uh, however, it's also very important to give support in the transition between um, getting children back, working with their children, and staying sober and working on their mental health issues. I think there's one question coming up. OK. Yes, I am familiar with the recovery coach model, both in home or by phone. Um, and that's, it's very similar to the peer support uh, model that you train and support the coach and you use the training or trainer model. Um, and I think there is something about um, the modeling effect that has such a strong impact on people's recovery, whether it's mental health or substance use disorders. But that being said, the recovery coach also needs support. We need to think about what it means to be in recovery and what it means to support someone uh, in recovery and at the same time take care of yourself. It's similar to um, some of us as, pay, <clears throat> as tr uh, treatment providers may experience compassion fatigue, burnout, and I think part of the recovery coach model, either it is by phone or in home, it's the same thing that needs to happen take care of yourself, and you cannot be an effective recovery coach if you don't take care of yourself. We have one minute left of this hour, and I really enjoyed spending time with you and also to try to answer your uh, questions. If there are any more questions coming, um, please send them our way. And I know that we will try the best we can to answer your questions. Thank you again for your time and for the opportunity to uh, spend an hour with you.